ಸಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ ಸಹನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾಹೈ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ ಓಂ ನಮಃ ಶಿವಾಯ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ ಓಂ ನಮಃ ಶಿವಾಯ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ವೆರ್ ಎಟ್ Uh, we had finished the 23rd verse right chapter 10 so we are on verse number 24 so we will chant shri bhagavan uvacha shri shri bhagavan uvacha ಗುರು ಧಂಸಾಂ ಚ ಮುಖ್ಯಂ ಚುರು ಧಂಸಾಂ ಚ ಮುಖ್ಯಂ ಮಾಧಿ ಪಾರ್ಥ ಬೃಹಸ್ಪತಿ ಸರಸಾಮಸ್ಮಿ ಸಾಗರ ಹೇ ಪಾರ್ಥ ಮಾಂ ವಿಧಿ ಸೊ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸಿಂಗ್ ಹೇ ಅರ್ಜುನ ನೋಮಿ as what mukhya purodhasam as the main among the priests and what is my name brahas brahaspati hi so brahaspati the main among the priests you should know me and also senani nam among all the senanis the commanders of the armies aham skandaha i am skandaha and sarasam so sarasam is a water body a reservoir so among all the reservoirs of water aham sagaraha asmi i am the ocean so again the same idea that he is the best among whatever there is and purodhasam is so there are two types of priests in the scriptures one is the worldly priests who officiate in rituals and one is the celestial priests who officiate in rituals there okay so you can take purohit as two types of purohits the worldly purohits and the heavenly purohits okay and among the heavenly purohits i am brahaspati hi so why is brahaspati so great shankar ayer writes he is the priest for indra and the other gods now when you say he is a priest for indra and the other gods you know these are all what you call uh, verses which are very light in nature he is trying to express that whatever is the best among anything i ishwara alun am you know you can have incidental questions which is good for racking the brain so one question can come up here because he is saying that i am the priest for the gods what question can you think of think he is the god himself so mm-hmm. to no, gods perform be. rituals too the does indra need a priest or the gods perform the rituals to perform oh. yagnyas very good point the priest performs yagnyas yes amrish yeah yeah kartu tum he does some karma no the question you have to ask yourself is what is the purpose of a priest what does a priest do he worships that means even gods have something higher to worship 
uh, that is why they need a priest. So what does a priest do when you engage a priest? He leads to... the ritual. Uh, he leads the homam, right? Yes. And in the homam, what is it that you do? If you've ever seen a homam, those who have, among you who have been on the TTCs, you would definitely have seen a homam. So what does the priest do first? Invite the gods. Invite the gods. Invite. Does that give you a question? So we need... The gods are already present there. No. The priests, the homam... Basically, the first job is to invoke the Lord, invoke gods, right? So, depending on which god you're invoking, you can invoke the Agni Devata, you can invoke Surya Devata, you can invoke Indra, depend, depending upon what sort of home it is. So, in Manushya Loka, <clears throat> rituals are meant for invoking gods. So, in Deva Loka, what are you going to invoke? Because it is being done for the God. You are saying he is a priest for the gods. Right? So, the, the idea being conveyed is that Manushyas perform Vedic rituals. Are the Vedic rituals applicable for Devatas? No. No. Because Devatas are the subject in the Vedic rituals. Like so they, that you have to, Indra is there, is mentioned in the Veda. Agni Devata is there, mentioned in the Veda. The ritual is to invoke them. And therefore, it is meant for the human being. It cannot possibly be meant for the Devatas. So what should be the interpretation of this word priest in Devaloka? Why does Indra need a priest? Okay, so it cannot possibly be for invocation of invocation of any god. So the correct translation has to be, it has to be the guru only. He is the acharya for the other gods. That is the interpretation here. And that is why Brihaspati is great because he is the guru of the lords. That is why he says, I am the greatest among the priests. Right? Okay. You understood why? It's it's not a very you know important understanding, but how should you use your mind? How should you use your intellect when you are reading the Bhagavad Gita? Are you just accepting what is being said or are you analyzing and saying, is it logical? And here it is not logical. Therefore, interpretation is it is the priest. It is not the priest who performs rituals. It is the guru. Then Senani Nam Aham Skandaha. Among all the Senapatis, he is Skandaha. He is, what is another name for Skandaha? Karthikeya. Murugan of Subramanya. Lord Subramanya. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, just as, I mean, again, because there's nothing much to say over here, that is why I'm asking this question. What is, why was Skandaha born? Why, why was Lord Subramanyam born? To kill Tarakasura. To kill Tarakasura. Tarakasura was a Asura with special strength who could not be subdued by the gods. And therefore, Shiva and Parvati, they gave birth to Skandaha, a person of extraordinary strength to, dis to destroy Tarakasura. So this is, again, not Vedantic, but since we are talking about it, you know, just the background. Then Sarsam Asmi Sagaraha, among all the water bodies, I am Sagara, the ocean, obviously because the ocean is the biggest of all the water bodies. Okay, verse number 25. Please, un please unmute yourselves. So, remember that uh, normally Maharishi it is the pronunciation. Maharishi, right? But here, the R is short. So, Maharshi Nam. Maharshi Nam Bhraguraham. Maharshi Nam Bhraguraham. Giramasmeka Maksharam. Giramasmeka Maksharam. 
All fairly self explicit. Maharshi Nam, among all the Maharishis, who am I? Aham Bhrugu. Then the break up of the other second, third word is Giram Asmi Ekam Aksharam. Giram Asmi Ekam Aksharam. When you put them together, the Sandhi makes them Giram Asmi Ekam Aksharam. So Giram, Giram is the words. Among all the words, what am I? Ekam Aksharam. I am the one syllabled word. And Yajna Nam, among all the Yajnas, Aham Japa Yajna Asmi. I am the Japa Yajna. And Sthavara Nam, Sthavaram is the mountain. So among Sthavara Nam, among all the mountains, Aham Himalaya. Okay, let's try to understand what this means. So Maharshi Nam. Who are the Maharshis? <laughs> what is a Maharishi? Saptarishis. Saptarishis. What are they? What is special about Saptarishis? They are sons of Brahmaji or born out of directly no, space eight meaning what directly meaning they created the all the prajaha yeah so basically what we say is they are manasa putras of brahmaji okay so they're born out of his mind right so among and they are called saptarishis the seven were born first okay. and among them Bhrugu is considered to be the greatest, the most eminent among the seven Maharishis. Bhrugu, therefore, among the Maharishis, I am Bhrugu. Note that there is another four also earlier, okay? So, those guys became sannyasis. So, altogether, there are 11 in the Puranas. But we are talking about the Saptarishis who were actually responsible for the pro procreation and all that. So, Bhrugu is considered the most preeminent Maharishi. And therefore, I that Maharishi, I am. Then Giram. Giram means uh, basically, Shankara writes in his commentary, Giram means that it is speech in the form of words. Right? It is speech delivered by you which is in the form of words and among all that, I am Ekamaksharam and lest we wonder what is Ekamaksharam, Shankara very clearly writes Ekamaksharam is equal to Omkara Asmi. Why is Omkara called Ekamaksharam? What is the meaning of Ekam in Omkara? Anybody? It is the substratum for all the words. So Eka Akshar, so that is why. From A to Ma. That's, uh, okay, that's fine, but. More uh, practically, when you pronounce words, you have syllables. How many syllables in Om? Three. No. One. One. Om. Okay. There are three alphabets. A, O, Ma. But the Sandhi of A and O makes it O. And Ma is when you close your mouth. So Om. Only one syllable. When you chant, you can make out Om, one syllable. So that is why it's called, Om. whenever you hear the word Ekam Aksharam, remember it refers to Om because Om is the only one syllable word which is important in the Vedas. Okay, now why do you say, why does he say among all the words I am Omkara? Because Omkara is, I've told you before, uh, once upon that time, you know, people used to chant the Vedas, right? And normally when you talk about Vedas, you, you chant, you talk about only three Vedas because the fourth one, Yajur, 
is not too much used in rituals. So we talk about Riksama and Atharvana. Atharvana. No, Riksama Yajur. Atharvana is not used. Atharvana is not used. Okay. Atharvana is not used. So Riksama Yajur you think about, right? Now people used to chant this Riksama Yajur regularly and then what happened was that uh, people started stopping the chanting because it took too long. And therefore, Brahmaji thought, let us give a shorter version. What was the shorter version? He summarized the three Vedas into one mantra, which is called the Gayatri, 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 Gayatri mantra. mantra. So then he thought, at least Gayatri Mantra people will chant. So people chanted for some time and then they found that that was also too difficult. So then he further reduced it to three Vyaratis. Bhur, Bhava, Swaha. And then that also was too difficult. So he further condensed it to one word, Om. Okay, so Om is supposed to be the uh, condensation of three Vedas. And therefore it is supposed to be very great. And in fact, it is so great that there is one Upanishad completely dedicated to Om. So those who are doing Mandukya in the Upanishad class, you know that we are talking about Omkara only. Okay. It is also a very efficacious mantra because Lord Brahmaji is supposed to have used this while creating. He is supposed to have said Om. And that is why in any Vedic ritual or any Vedic Parayanam, what do you do? You start with Om. Om Guru Bhyo Namaha. Right. Also, when you do the, do the Upanishads, you will see that Omkara is used as an alambanam for many, many uh, meditations. Alambanam is the symbol on which you invoke the Lord. So, there are Omkara meditations. Therefore, in Karma Kanda, also Omkara is used. In Upasana Kanda, also Omkara is used. And in Vedanta, Omkara is used for an inquiry into Brahman. So the Mandukya Upanishad says, Bhutam Bhavad Bhavishyati Sarvam Omkara Eva. Omkara is all that was there in the past, all that is there today, and all that is there in the future also. And therefore Krishna says, among all the words, I am Omkara, the most important one. Then, Yajnanam Japa Yajna Asmi. Right? So when you come to <coughs> Yajna and Japa, Japa is what? How is it different from Parayana? Japa is repeating the same <laughs> mantra again and again. And again. Yeah. Parayana is reading. Parayana is reading from beginning to end. So you can be reading in one chapter, you can be reading the whole Gita. But you do it only once. So Paranam is the reading from beginning to end. Japa is a repetition of a mantra or a Ishwara Nama. That is different Paranam. Why is he saying it is he is the Japa Yajna? Because this Japa Yajna, number one, there are no restrictions on who can chant Om. So you will find that in rituals, in the in the Vedas, of course. I mean, those who are familiar with the Vedic part, the Karmakanda part of it, you will find that there are rituals which ka, which are restricted to Brahmanas, the rituals which Kshatriyas can only perform, the rituals which only Vaishyas can perform, there are rituals which only Brahmacharis can perform, there are rituals only Grihasthas can perform, and so on. Right. So all yajnas, there are restrictions. For example, if you take Agnihotram, who can do Agnihotram? Grihastha. Only a grihastha. A brahmachari or a sannyasi is prohibited from doing so. Right? If you take Rajasuya Yaga, Yagnya, or Yaga as it is called, who can do? Only? Only Kshatriya. Kshatriya can do. Brahmacharis, I mean, uh, Brahmins are not are prohibited from that. But this Japa Yagnya, Omkara Yagnya is something which all can do. Whether you are any of the four Varanas can do. Whether you are, any of the four ashramas can also do. Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaspati, uh, Manaspra, Manaprastha, Sanyasis, everybody can do. There are no restrictions at all. 
that is number one secondly in many ritualistic parts of the veda you have specific time and place where you can practice a particular ritual and that is why vedic astrology is, was born because it gives the tithi and the time and the, and the where the star is what time you can do particular homa all that is given so there are time and place restrictions of homas but for japa yagna there is no such thing you don't have to face a particular direction and you don't have to be at a particular time you don't have to be sitting in a particular posture wherever japa yagna is done no restrictions are there at all then no expenditures involved all other rituals some amount of money is spent right so here no expenditures involved it can be done by a very rich man and also a poverty stricken person there is no expenditure then one more point is in many rituals there is fire and wherever there is fire there may be some involuntary harm to some living thing some mosquito some fly some insect in japa yagna there is complete ahimsa nobody gets hurt or killed okay so it is said that every vedic student every day should do sadhana of japa yagna and the word japa itself the j ja indicates what janma vichedaha the breaking of the cycle of janma and maranam and pa indicates papa nasanaha so japa is janma vichedanaha papa nasanaha removing all the papams and because of that a cycle of birth and death is broken samsara comes to an end and therefore japa is a very great sadhana then sthavarana himalaya among all the mountains i am the tallest one himalaya is the tallest mountain so i am the greatest one okay now verse number 26 ashvatha sarva ashvatha sarva vrikshanam ಅಶ್ವಸರ್ವೃಕ್ಷ ಗಂಧರ್ವಾ ಚಿತ್ರರಸ ಕಪಿಲೋ ಮು ಗಂಧರ್ವಾಂ among all the gandharvas i am chitra ratah and siddha naam among all the people who got siddhis i am kapila muni okay so sarva vriksha naam aham ashvatah i am the ashvatha tree among all the trees why is this sacred why is the ashvatha tree sacred everybody knows okay so there is uh, i think it's called the ashvatha vriksha stotram you know there is stotram to the ashvatha tree also so i'll just talk about a couple of lines from there it says mulato brahma roopaya mulaha is what the root of the tree brahma roopaya at the root of the ashvatha tree brahma ji presides molato brahma roopaya madhyado vishnu roopena in the middle of the tree that is in the trunk of the tree vishnu presides agrataha on top of the tree shiva roopaya shiva resides and therefore rajaya vriksha te namaha the king of the trees to them to that tree i give my namaskar okay so just for information 
then devarshi devarshi nam naradaha among all the uh, the rishis who are in devaloka i am naradaha the most popular rishi okay now what is a rishi actually we can we can talk of that also when are the veda mantras handed over to creation anybody knows they appear to them during when are the veda mantras actually present in creation or how is it present at the time of creation only they were present but received by the rishis yeah at the time of creation it is said that bhagwan ensures that the veda mantras are present shabda roopena in the form of sound already in the environment in akasha but because of the extreme subtlety of the veda mantras only people who have got extraordinary punyam have the capacity to un- to grasp these mantras in meditation right so this intuitive power which they have because of the extraordinary punyam such people are called rishis so rishati janati iti rishi the one who can understand the veda mantras because of the extraordinary punyam which they have they are called rishis and an interesting thing is that in some of the books texts rishis are not considered manushya jati they are considered to be a separate class called rishi jati and shankara adds somewhere that rishis are available not only in uh, earth and bhuloka but also in devaloka and those rishis who are available in devaloka they are called devarishis okay so this is the background what is the job of the devarishi or or of a normal rishi it is to understand grasp the veda mantras which are already there at the time of creation the mantras have been handed over by way of sound into akasha these people in their meditation they understand and then they put it into actual words for the benefit of human beings they are rishis so very important link between ishvara and us then gandharva nam chitra ratha so gandharvas are uh, celestial beings who are uh, famous for dance music painting all forms of art and among the gandharvas there is a king called chitra ratha that king i am then an important one siddha nam among the siddhas i am kapilo muni what is a siddha so what is a siddhi right so shankara defines siddhi as janma naiva from birth dharma jnana vairagya aishwaryam what does it remind you of bhagwan bhagwan now the point is when you say siddhi when you say this siddha who can has all these uh, qualities and shankara also says atishaya in full measure so these people have dharma jnana vairagya aishwarya in the full measure which is the exact definition of ishwara right now can you take this definition for a for a muni for kapila muni for example if you take this definition what happens he becomes a this should be the lakshartham because bhagwan has everything in every measure but uh, it's taken yes, because he is a jnani he cannot create he cannot create at all hmm. overlordship he cannot have therefore 
you cannot take the meaning of Aishwaryam. Aishwaryam is overlordship. Okay. Overlordship means he has full powers to create, destroy, maintain. And therefore, you cannot take the meaning. Therefore, what do you have to take it as? What are the other siddhis available? Ashta siddhis. So, Anima, Mahima, Lagima, Garima. I hope you know what that means. What is Anima? Mm. Not Anima. Small, become very small. Become small. 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 Mahima become big. Yeah. Laghima to become light. Garima to become heavy. These are all Ashta Siddhis which are mentioned in the Puranas. And therefore here you have to take Siddhas as people who have got miraculous powers of all the Siddhis. Extraordinary powers they have got. They are not to be equated as this, the Siddhis which are taken as Ishwara's qualities, that is to be not taken, just the local Siddhis, not the Lord Siddhis, right? And one thing we should remember is that what is the connection between Siddhis and Atma Jnanam? No connection. There is no connection. And therefore, when you look at people, generally, in you can classify them into four types. Those who have got Siddhis, but no Atma Jnana. That is the first type of person. Those who have got Atma Jnana, but no Siddhi. Third is, those who have got Atma Jnana, and those who have got Siddhi also. And the fourth is? They have neither. Neither. They have neither Atma Jnana nor Siddhi. Out of these four, who are Jeevan Muktaha? Has Jnanam but no Siddhi. The one who has Atma Jnanam. Yes. The with character. or without one Siddhis. Atma Jnanam with or without Siddhis. Okay. Don't confuse. The Atma Jnanam is the Hetu for Jeevan Mukti. And therefore whether he has Siddhi or not along with Atma Jnanam is, is not relevant at all. Whether he has Atma Jnanam alone is relevant. Right? Therefore, Kapila Muni here is a person who had both Jnanam and Siddhi. So that is why he is supposed to be the greatest among the of Siddhas. Because he had Jnanam. Siddhi to he has, but he has Jnanam. Now, one should not confuse, you know, this Kapila Muni with Kapila Rishi. Who is Kapila Rishi? Sankhya. And lost philosophy. Sankhya originator. Okay, so it's, let's not confuse them. They are different. Okay, while we are on Siddhis, uh, how will you get Siddhis? Supposing you desire. As Vedantic students, I know you don't re desire. Okay. But if somebody asks you, how will I get Siddhis? Siddhis, what is the answer? The answer is contained all over the Puranas. I don't know if you all have read. Okay. So one is by use of certain precious stones. So don't ask me which, I don't know. So Purana say somewhere that Siddhis can be obtained by if you have certain stones with you. Then, one is by use of certain types of Aushadams, herbs. And there's, now we neither know the stones, nor we don't know the herbs. So, you know, and they're not very clearly mentioned anywhere. So we can just forget about them. There is a third type which is mentioned in the uh, Puranas. They say that if you do Purascharanam sufficient number of times, then you get Siddhis. What is Purascharanam? Reciting the same mantra, I think 24 yes. million times or two point something like that. Uh, there is a connection between the number of letters that the mantra, syllables that the mantra has and the repetitions. Now, for example, let us take Om. How many um, syllables does Om have? One. one. Yes. One. Okay. How many syllables does Om Namah Shivaya have? 
Six. Panchakshara. Panchakshara. Five. 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 No, Panchakshara is five. Namah Shiva is Panchakshara. Om Namah Shiva has got six. 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 You can count. Na, ma, si, va, ya. Five. <coughs> Om Namah Shiva has got six. Okay. So when you take Om Namah Shivaya, it has got six, six syllables. So Purascharanam is multiplying that by either a lakh or a crore, however much time you have got. Okay. So if you have to do, do the minimum Purascharanam for Om Namah Shivaya, it is six lakhs. And you can do six crores also. Or you can do 600 crores. So they say that the potency, the power of the mantra is released when Purasharanam is done. Now the thing is that, you know, you don't have time to see Avnama Shivaya once. So, six crore times, I don't know. Then there are other uh, methods which are prescribed. So one is, Yoga Shastra says, Samadhi. When you go into Samadhi, and you focus on particular, uh, you know, words or particular objects, then you get particular types of powers. And the easiest one is previous Janma Punyam. That you don't have control over, but if you have a control, then you know that I've got it. Fine. So these are five, five uh, I know, there may be others also, I don't know. And I would recommend that you don't go trying to practice this because if you get Siddhis, what is the advantage for Vedantic students? No, no advantage. There is no special but advantage, but it can no mislead advantage. you. It can mislead you. You might focus on that and forget about your studies. So, avoidable. Okay. Now we look at the next verse, which is verse number 27. <clears throat> Uchai Shravasamashwanam Uchai Shravasamashwanam Uchai Shravasamashwanam Uchai Shravasamashwanam Vidhi Mama Mratod Bhavam Vidhi Mama Mratod Bhavam Airavatam Gajendranam Airavatam Gajendranam Naranam Chanaradhipam Naranam Okay. So with him, ma'am, know that I, Ashwanam, among all the horses, I am Uchai Shavasam. That is the name of a horse. Uchai Shavasam. And where was this horse found? Amritaha Udbhavam. Amritaha means nectar. Udbhavam means born. So Amritaha Udbhavam means born from the nectar. Therefore, you need knowledge of Quran as to know what it means. What does it mean? Samudra Manthan. Who was born during Samudra Manthan. Okay. I, know, I hope everybody knows what Samudra Manthan is. If not, please stay now and somebody can explain. Anybody doesn't know? I don't know. Acharya Ji. Lata Ji. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, would somebody like to explain to Lataji what to Samudra Vantan? Very short. A long time ago, gods and, uh, sorry, the Devas and Rakshasas, they were fighting all the time. And Rakshasas had, uh, through Shukracharya, who is their guru, they had uh, uh, what you call Mrita Sanjeevani Vidya. So all these Rakshasas would die in the battle, then they'll come back alive. And they just become more powerful. So gods actually were being defeated all the time. So they went to Bhagwan Vishnu and ultimately he suggested churning the milky ocean uh, and then get the Amrita, which can be used for gods to become immortal. Uh, so in the end, 
they trick all the rakshasas into helping them they use the vasuki who is the one of the biggest snakes who is around uh, ishwara's neck so he was used as the rope and uh, the the meru parvata which was which was talked about in the last class that was used as the churning stick but then the churning stick would not stay in the ocean it will not stay up so vishnu had to come as kurma avatara he actually uh, stood underneath the the meru parvata he supported the meru so that gods and uh, rakshasas could churn the ocean and and through that ocean uh, churning they got a lot of things i think 14 things they got one of them is ma lakshmi then chandra then this uchchayshravas which is the horse of indra then airavata which is the elephant of indra uh, and then kaustubamani which is what is there in in vishnu's uh, chest so these are all 14 good things along with the amrita which actually came out uh, in the hands of dhanvantari so he is again another avatar of vishnu who brought the uh, nectar the amrita and then came out but before all these things came out the bad thing came out and that is the halahala which is the which is the poison that that actually uh, came from the mouth of vasuki which was again taken up by ishwara and he basically then that's how they protected the the universe excellent nagaraj is a very short and succinct thank summary nagaraj ji thank you yes got it got it i did right. see this kind of a story on tv so yeah i could relate yeah okay. <laughs> thanks so as he said vasuki was used as a rope and uh, vishnu ji was the base for the mountain and so during the journey 14 things as nagaraj ji said came out so, chaturdasha 14 things came out and the first one which came out was who oh, anybody knows lakshmi devi okay and the story goes that the what do you call ocean king samudra raja he took lakshmi devi and went to the person who was best dressed in the whole congregation and handed over over lakshmi devi to her who was best dressed vishnu vishnu he had silk and yellow garments and all that and therefore you, you need to be dressed well for the story and when the poison came he gave it to whom the person who was the worst dressed who was shiva uh-huh. okay so therefore the shiva drank the poison and the story goes that uh parvati said oh my god what is this foolish husband of mine doing and then she put his she put her hands around his neck and pressed it so the poison nilakantha that's why nilakantha okay all you know you don't have to take it very seriously but these are all small small stories with which you can entertain your children at least okay now vedantically this milky ocean it represents the satvic mind which is involved in spiritual sadhana and the churning is the japa puja which brings out various siddhis which are represented by the various precious things in the story lakshmi devi airavatam meneka all the etc right now if the devas and asuras had stopped with the precious stones then amritam was not there amritam would have not come and we would not have got moksha so in the spiritual world what is being said is that in this practice also you will get many worldly benefits right because japa yagna is being uh, uh, compared to the samudra manthanam and therefore you will get many benefits but the idea is don't get enamored by the siddhis keep your practice steady but towards the end hala hala will also come hala hala is the poison which for the seeker is in the form of various serious mental disturbances right why would the mental disturbances come because normally my mind is engaged with worldly problems right but in spiritual sadhana you have put aside the worldly problems 
the mind is relatively free from the worldly problems. And when the mind is not occupied, occupied with all the worldly problems, there are thousands of repressed memories in your subconscious mind. Who treated you like this? Who called you a dog? How did my parent treat me? How did my mother scold me? And how did my father hit me? All these things will surface. Right? These are subconscious memories. We have never dealt with them. We don't know how to deal with it. And therefore, this is indicated with all these internal problems surfacing and disturbing you is indicated through the hala hala poisoning which is coming from your own mind. And why is it coming? Because you are churning your mind through the Shastra Vichara. What is the, what is the solution? And the hala hala Poison comes. What was the solution? Persist with sadhana. In the story, the solution is what? Ishwara drinks the poison. Therefore, for us, in your meditation, if you find serious disturbances, you have to go back to surrender to the Lord. If you surrender to the Lord, He will drink the poison. You will continue with your sadhana. Right? And then, of course, there are other things. Why the words are mentioned over here? Uchai Shravasaha. Ashwa Nam. Ashwa is a horse. Shravasam means uh, fame, kirti. Uchai Shravasam means the most famous one. Right? So, among the horses, that white special horse which came out of that churning is the most famous horse. That's why Uchai Shravasam Ashwa Nam. Is the most, that horse I am. And Vidhi Maam Amrito Bhavam. I am that horse which emerged during the Amrita Manthanam. Similarly, Airavatam Gajendranam. Among all the Gajendras, elephants, I am the Airavatam. The white elephant which came out from the Samudra Manthanam and was handed over to Lord Indra. And Naranam Naradhipa. Among all the human beings, I am the king. So this is a indication that the king of a nation has to protect dharma. Therefore, as protector of dharma, the king is taken as the lord himself. And therefore, Krishna says, I am the very king also. Okay, right. We have time for another verse. We will do that. Incidentally, I am giving a lot of unnecessary stories, okay? Just to make it interesting. If you guys don't want that, we'll focus only on the uh, meanings and go ahead. How do you want me to go ahead? Stories, sir, please, please give us stories. Sir, please give yeah. us stories. Always with stories, Guruji. So, Acharya, in fact, I wanted to ask you, where does one get these stories from? How does one um, read these stories? Any from source? Raviji. You from Raviji, Puranas. Get... <laughs> no, no, Puranas. Puranas. <laughs> Puranas are many, many Puranas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Verse number 28. Last one for today. Ayudhana Maham Vajram. Ayudhana Maham Vajram. Enu Rajanash Chasikandar Paha Arpana must me vasuki. So Ayudan Ayudhanam Aham Vajram. Among all the weapons, I am the Vajra. What is, whose weapon is Vajra? Indra. Indra. Indras. Devendras, the, the king of the gods, his weapon is Vajra. And if you know the story, um, of course, Shankaran is commentary mentioned this. Mentions, he simply says, Dadichi Asti Sambhavam. Means, Asti here is what? Bones. Dadichi was a Maharishi. Right? So this, the story goes that 
there was a very strong um, asura. I think it's called Rathrasura. Rathrasura. I'm not very sure of the name. Rathrasura was, a, was the asura who was very, very strong. And it was not possible for the gods to uh, overpower him at all. Right? Because they didn't have a weapon which was strong enough to kill him. And then they went to Dadichi Maharishi and uh, asked him, how do we kill this Asura? So Dadichi Maharishi, of course he was a Maharishi, he had uh, years and years of tapas and because of that his body was very, very strong. Maharishi's body. Bones were extremely strong. Right? So Maharishi told them that, okay, there is only one uh, substance available in this world which has the strength to destroy this Vratrasura. What is that? Those are my bones. So he said, I will, you know, offer you my body. You take the bones and you make the weapon. So this bones born out of the Shakti of Tapas. They were used. So Maharishi sacrifices his life and the gods use the bones to make the Vajra. And with that Vajra, the Asura is killed. As I said, I'm giving you stories. Okay, In thinking that maybe some of you all may not have read the Puranas. If you have read the Puranas, it is already there. But there, Shankara considers it important enough to write in his commentary. Dadichi Asti Sambhava. Weapon made out of the bones of Tadichi Maharishi. Then, Dhenunam Asmi Kamadhuk. So, Kamadhuka is a... Uh, what is a Dhenu, incidentally? Cow. 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 A Dhenu is a special cow, okay? Dhenu is a cow which yields milk. So, I am presuming there are cows which don't yield milk. So, that's why Dhenu. So, milk yielding cows. And among the milk yielding cows, I am Kamaduk. Kamaduk is what? Kamadhenu. Who? Is a cow which will give you what you desire. Right? So, if you go to the cow and ask for ice cream, <laughs> you will get ice cream. Not necessarily get milk. You can go and ask for pizza also. You will get pizza also. Kamaduk. Go and pray. He will give you directly. You don't have to go to the shop. Okay, that is a story. Now, symbolically, Vedantically, what is this Kamadhenu equivalent to? A human intellect. It is your own mind and intellect. Tapping their intellect properly, mankind can achieve anything in life, including moksha. Therefore, your mind is the Kamadhenu. Tap properly, it can give you wealth. Tap properly, it can give you moksha. That improperly, it can give you lots of misery. It can convert you into a terrorist also. You have to utilize properly. Okay. <laughs> then, prajanas chasmi kandharpaha. Kandharpaha means um, desire, kama. So, desire is the greatest uh, producer of things. So, everything that is produce, produced in creation, remember, is produced because of human desire only. And therefore, what is the strongest of all human desires? Sex. To procreate? Yes. No, you pro sex you say is the strongest. But Shastra says yes. What, what is the objective of that sex? It is to have desire for children. Therefore, the strongest desire for a person, because, you know, when I have a child, then I think that I won't die because I live on in my children, which is not what Vedanta says, but Vedanta says every jiva is separate. Okay, so that Vedanta destroys that illusion of yours that you will live along with your child. You won't. But anyway, normally people have children because they think that when they die, their children will live on and they will live on in their children. So it's the strongest of all desires. And therefore it says, Prajanas Chashme Kandarpaha. Among all the desires, I am the desire for prodigies, for children. Prajanha. Prajani. Okay. And therefore production of children is also born of desire. See, 
earlier on in the seventh chapter remember krishna said aham dharma aviruddha kama asmi i am that desire which is not against dharma so he is pointing it out that this reproductive desire here has to be connected to aham dharma aviruddha kama asmi that statement which is that pure sexual desire is not what is being mentioned here that desire with the desire for reproduction that is mentioned here okay then sarpanam asmi vasukihi among all the sarpas all the snakes i am vasukihi and what is so special because vasuki is around the neck of lord shiva and usually around the neck what do we wear we wear a oh. ornament and therefore this snake vasuki is the ornament for lord shiva and remember that vasuki the ornament symbolizes the ahankara and therefore he is saying that lord shiva for lord shiva ahankara is a ornament the poisonous snake is being used as a ornament if it is not used as a ornament and it is allowed to you know use its power as ahankara ahankara is poison which leads to kartratvam karma phalam punarapi janmam punarapi maram in short ahankara leads to samsara and if you can master the ahankara then for you the ahankara is like the ornament for lord shiva which means that once you have mastered ahankara when you say i you are using the word i figuratively it doesn't mind you anymore and therefore atmajnanam consists of what learning how to handle my ahankara for worldly transactions without being completely caught up in that ahankara okay so with this we'll stop for today any questions all right in this case we'll close for today thank you for your patience om purnamala purnamidam purnat purnamulachate purnasya purnamadam eva vishishyate om shanti 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 om tat sat om namo shivaya thank you for your patience thank you acharya ji thank you